Uh, the hearing will come to order. The Tactical Air and Land Force Subcommittee meets today to review the Army and Marine Corps Ground Modernization Program for fiscal year 2022 budget request. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like to thank our witnesses for being with us today and for the work done to put in together this year's budget request Congress. Following a year of unprecedented challenges, the committee is eager to hear details from today's witnesses on how the service budget request will satisfy the equipment requirements and the Army and Marine Corps both today and into the future. Subcommittee will closely examine the choices made for modernization, as well as how those choices are preserved and reduce risk in our defense industrial base. Certainly this year, COVID pandemic has elevated our concerns for the successful management of the risk in the industrial base. I am grateful to both Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and senior leadership for their openness with this. I also want to add for those men and women working throughout the nation at the depots, at the factories during the pandemic. Uh, we really appreciate what you've done, and it's incredibly important for our country. Uh, we're going to look at the, uh, the following impacts on both the military and civilian fronts, supporting their management through this pandemic, and now look forward to restoring the workforce to a safe, efficient operation. The goal for both services is always to achieve a modern ground force that can match or exceed our peer and near peer potential adversaries. Services must realistically assess their requirement and make those trade offs at an acceptable risk. Between investment priorities, current and future capabilities, and the industrial base security and stability. Across the uh, past three budget cycles, Army and Marine Corps have made significant changes and tough choices with respect to their plans to develop, produce, and field future capabilities. An essential matter of congressional oversight, we must have the confidence that the Army and Marine Corps modernization strategies are realistic, achievable, and affordable. We understand that the services budget requests and modernization plans that many of the high priority development programs will soon enter low rate initial production, complete operational testing, and if testing successfully, start full rate production. Number of systems entering these phases at this time creates a bow wave of new, of new procurement funding that if not budgeted means that the modernization strategy is not achievable. Today, we will ask each of the witnesses to state for the record that given the uh, 2022 budget request and the assumed or planned funding levels over the next five years, all priority ground modernization programs are affordable and achievable. The distinguished Army, Navy, Marine Corps leaders before the subcommittee today, as well as being qualified, they are going to have to explain their modernization budget request. I'd like to welcome Mr. Doug Bush, Acting Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology. General John Murray, Commanding General, Army's Future Command. Mr. J. Stefani, Acting Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, and Acquisition and Lieutenant General Eric Smith, Commanding General, Marine Corps, Combat Development Command, and the Deputy Commandant for Combat Development and Integration. We look forward to your testimony and in discussing these topics. But before we begin, I'd like to turn to our ranking member from the great state of Missouri, Mrs. Hart, sir, for any comments she has. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would first like to thank our witnesses for being with us today and for the hard work uh, that you put in, in this year's budget a request to Congress. We have 
a lot to cover today, and I look forward to having a healthy discussion with our distinguished panel of witnesses, some of whom have testified before us on these topics just over a year ago. And what a year it's been, uh, full of extraordinary challenges, uncertainty, and transitions for everyone, none more so than for our military and its supporting industrial base. And now the president's FY 2022 budget request asked the Department of Defense and the industrial bases which support it to do even more with less. I, like many of my colleagues, am deeply concerned about the proposed top line and that it does not adequately resource the 2018 National Defense Strategy and further places military leadership in an untenable position of having to make impossible choices between near-term operational readiness, the sustainment of enduring capabilities, and long-term modernization priorities. Today is an opportunity for our witnesses to address these concerns. As we discuss the future modernization of the Army and Marine Corps ground programs, I expect the witnesses to identify what risk the Army and Marine Corps are accepting in the short term in order to keep planned modernization programs affordable and on course to meet the mid to long-term defense requirements of creating a more lethal, resilient, and agile force able to compete, deter, and win against future threats from both peer competitors and rogue actors. I commend our military leaders for their dedication and hard work to continuously reassess modernization investment priorities and reallocate already limited resources to fund the development and procurement of essential defense requirements and capabilities necessary to build a more lethal defense force. The Army in particular has terminated or reduced 310 existing programs in the last three years, including the elimination or delay of 37 programs in FY22 alone to meet this end state. I'm interested in the Army and Marine Corps' assessment of how a flat top line and the resulting imposition of cuts and decreases to lower priority programs and investment accounts affect the health and stability of the industrial base. Cutting plans and funding for development and procurement programs creates vendor uncertainty, workforce disruptions, and a lack of predictability over time. Doing so also increases unit costs and risk the loss of industrial capacity, capability, and resilience when minimum sustaining rates are not met. Finally, I wanna stress the importance of jointness between the Army and the Marine Corps. I'd like our witnesses to discuss how they are continuing to communicate and coordinate on critical modernization programs that could address similar operational requirements such as body armor, long range precision fires and next generation small arms weapons. I thank the chairman for organizing this important and timely hearing and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, next, we understand that each army witness will provide short opening remarks starting with Mr. Bush, followed by General Murray. Then Mr. Stefani will provide their perspective from the Marine Corps. Uh, we have, without objections, each of the witnesses' prepared statements will be included in the hearing record. So, ordered, Mr. Bush, welcome and uh, please start. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chairman Norcross, Ranking Member Hartzler, distinguished members of the House Armed Services Committee uh, on Tactical Air and Land Forces, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation to appear before you to discuss the Army's ground modernization program and the resources requested in the President's budget for fiscal year 2022. I'm pleased to be joined today by my teammate, General Mike Murray, as well as our Navy and Marine Corps counterparts. We appreciate your making our written statement part of the record for today's hearing. Mr. Chairman, Army Acquisition Logistics and Technology and Army Futures Command shared mission is to make sure that the Army continues to achieve overmatch against all potential adversaries, ensuring that our Army can fulfill its mandate to com compete successfully, deter, and if necessary, fight and win our nation's wars as part of the joint force. We support the Army's transformation through modernization in order to meet future challenges. 
even during a global pandemic this past year has been one of dramatic change. Rapid innovation, shared challenges, and significant progress with an unprecedented unity of effort across the Army modernization enterprise. I'd like to next answer the committee's specific questions provided in the invitation uh, we received to testify. First, the committee asked us to provide, quote, major plan changes to the modernization and equipping strategy and an explanation of any new modernization, major new modernization initiatives between FY21 and FY22. The answer to those questions is that first, the Army has no major plan changes, and second, that there are no new major modernization initiatives. Second, the committee asked us to provide justification for, quote, unfunded priorities, major equipment shortfalls, or unacceptable risk. With regard to unfunded priorities, I would refer members to the Army Chief of Staff's unfunded priorities list. In addition, I am not aware of any major equipment shortfalls or unacceptable risks in my area of responsibility. Finally, the committee asked for an, quote, assessment of risks associated with major program terminations or reductions between FY21 and FY22. My assessment is that the small number of programs terminated or canceled and the larger number of program uh, reductions do not create unmanageable risk. Overall, I think the FY22 budget request for Army modernization reflects continuity and the Army's continued commitment to its high priority modernization programs. While members will find that adjustments were made to some programs, I believe that the FY22 budget request of $34.1 billion for Army research development and acquisition reflects careful choices and supports continued progress on the Army's top modernization and priorities. Army modernization also includes a commitment to reform. We are grateful to you and your colleagues on the committee for reform initiatives that have been instrumental to our efforts to streamline and gain efficiencies in the acquisition process and accelerate the delivery of capability to soldiers. This includes our use of middle tier acquisition authority for rapid prototyping to accelerate select efforts linked to our modernization priorities, including the extended range cannon artillery, integrated visual augmentation system, and next generation squad weapon, among others. We've also used other transactional authority or OTAs to help us streamline acquisition research initiatives, pro prototype projects, and follow on production efforts. In both of these areas, you have my commitment that the Army will use these authorities conservatively and only when needed to accomplish Army modernization objectives. You also have my commitment to ensure that appropriate internal Army oversight measures are in place to monitor the use of these authorities. Let me close by saying that realization of our modernization efforts is highly dependent on what is in the Army's FY22 budget request. The investments in this budget request complement and reinforce Army modernization efforts that you have so fast, so steadfastly supported. The key is predictable, adequate, timely, and sustained funding to ensure the United States Army is the best equipped land force in the world. I sincerely appreciate your time today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. General Murray. Chairman Rowcross, Ranking Member Hartzler, and distinguished members of the Tactical Air Land Subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify about Army ground modernization programs on behalf of the soldiers and civilians of Army Futures Command. These men and women are working hard each and every day to modernize our Army. And it's an honor to join Mr. Doug Bush, as well as Mr. Stephanie and Lieutenant General Smith here today. And I would just note that the partnership between AFC and ASALT was strong in the past and it remains strong under Mr. Bush's dedicated leadership. The Army is in the midst of a transformational change. This change is necessary to maintain our global competitive edge and to deter future conflict and to fight and win if called upon as part of the joint force. The Army is transforming how we fight, what we fight with, how we organize, how we do business, and who we are. Project Convergence, the Army's campaign of learning and experimentation, is informing all of these aspects of transformation. And I'd like to say a word about each of them in turn. First, we're transforming how we fight. The Army's current concept is multi-domain operations, our contribution to the developing joint warfighting concept. Right now, the Army's Training and Doctrine Command is in the process of transitioning multi-domain operations, the concept, into the next Army doctrine. At the same time, 
Army Futures Command's Future Studies Program is bringing together our concept writers, intelligence professionals, and s and experts with leading thinkers from academia, industry, and other communities to build our next concept. Second, we're transforming what we fight with. Our material modernization includes the 31 plus four signature efforts based upon our six consistent modernization priorities. Our FY22 request includes $11.3 billion to support these signature efforts. 31 of these efforts are led by powerful teams comprised of our cross-functional teams, program executive offices, and program managers. And four of these efforts are led by the Army's Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office. 22 of these capabilities are projected to be ready to begin fielding over the next four years. Third, we're transforming how we organize. The multi-domain task force will enable convergence, the integration of effects across all domains for joint force commanders to create, mul to create multiple dilemmas for our adversaries. Security force assistance brigades foster close partnerships with host nation ground forces in critical locations. They give us a strong foundation in competition and a head start in crisis and conflict. Fourth, we're transforming how we do business. Soldier-centered design puts technology and prototypes into the hands of soldiers from the operational force early so that we can learn. Learning early changes how we generate requirements and how we partner with both traditional and non-traditional industry. Our Army Applications Lab is spearheading effective ways to work with non-traditional innovators, leveraging existing authorities to make it easier for them to work with the Army. Fifth, we're transforming who we are. We are exploring how to best find, train, utilize, and keep the tech talent we know we will need for a future fight. Our Artificial Intelligence Integration Center works with Carnegie Mellon University to offer data science courses to grow software designers and engineers and to foster a more technology savvy workforce. Our software factory takes soldiers from any career field with the right aptitude and grows them into skilled coders. We're in the process of transforming almost every aspect of our army. There are, however, two key things we're holding on to. That would be our purpose and our most precious resource, our soldiers. Our fiscal year 22 request builds on the consistent priorities and strong momentum of our FY21 request. Stable and consistent funding from Congress supports our ability to serve our nation, take care of our people, and continue the momentum of our modernization efforts. Thank you for your consistent support of our Army and our families, and thank you for having me here today. It is an honor to lead and represent the soldiers, civilians, and families of Army Futures Command, and I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, General. Mr. Stefani, you're recognized. Yes, sir, Chairman. Uh, as you mentioned, we have a single statement for General Smith and myself. Uh, Chairman Norcross, Ranking Member Hartzler, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, on behalf of myself and Lieutenant General Eric Smith, the Deputy Commandant for Combat Development and Integration, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to address the Department of Navy's fiscal year 22 budget request for Marine Corps ground modernization programs. We are pleased to testify alongside our Department of the Army colleagues. Marines traditionally serve as soldiers of the sea with capabilities that are closely aligned to those of our Army brethren. We continue to collaborate on supporting and interconnected programs as the Department of Navy integrates with the joint force across our ground modernization portfolio. The Marine Corps is transforming warfighting capabilities to provide an organized, trained, and equipped force, posture for competition, and to respond to crisis in a contested maritime space. As we focus on the pending threat presented by our strategic competitors, we thank Congress and this subcommittee for your leadership and your support. The President's fiscal year 22 budget request for Marine Corps ground modernization takes a full step out of the Commandant's planning guidance and Force Design 2030 strategic initiative. The budget supports the vision for distributed maritime operations and focuses on capabilities our forward deployed forces need to defer conflict, I'm sorry, to deter conflict with an emphasis on long range precision fires, resilient communication, and training. 
grand modernization programs referenced in our written statement are affordable, executable, and on schedule. The FY22 request prioritizes investments that maximize naval contributions to the joint force while reducing risk in programs of record and accelerating capability delivery to Marines in the field. The request represents the deliberate and informed development of a modernized, integrated, all domain naval force for the future that requires us to think differently, move faster, and prioritize every dollar to meet an uncertain and complex environment. The Marine Corps ground modernization portfolio aims to do just that. And Lieutenant General and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, I just want to drop back as the foundation for the hearing that I had asked the question for the record that given the 2020 request, the planned funding levels over the next five years, all the priority ground modernization programs are affordable and achievable. Uh, Mr. Bush, would you agree with that statement? Sir, I would with an important caveat that uh, the administration only, has only presented the FY22 numbers at this point. Uh, absolutely. General Murray, would you concur? I, I concur with Mr. Bush's caveat, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stefani, for addressing that. Uh, General Smith, would you agree with that? Mr. Chairman, I do. I'm in concert with uh, Secretary Stephanie. Yes, sir. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, you know, three years, the night court, the constant review, reallocation of money. This is a, um, a major shift. Uh, Ms. Hartzler talked about the industrial base and uncertainty. Uh, so the risk in each of these can be significant. Uh, but one of the items I want to touch base on now is with the reorganization of the Army related to research, development, acquisition, financial management programs as we see the erosion of civilian responsibility and authority for control and oversight. Mr. Bush, what is your assessment of the status and the plans for change at any regarding the distribution of responsibilities and authority for oversight of the Army modernization and the relationship, the relationship between acquisition community and Army's future command? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the law is crystal clear in this regard. If you look at Title 10, uh, with regard to how responsibility is allocated to civilians for acquisition and research and development. Uh, that being said, the Army does have flexibility uh, within the law to task organize and assign responsibilities across the Army and the Army staff. Um, so I am uh, comfortable with the law and the way it works and the Army will follow the law and I see no current issues in that regard. Uh, the teamwork is necessary to make everything happen. So it's not, the Army modernization cannot be accomplished by my organization alone, nor by General Murray's or anybody else's. But right now I'm comfortable with what the law says, sir. So you have that independent authority necessary to approve, modify, prohibit, reverse actions. Um, if in the research and development, the acquisition recommendations, decision or action is inconsistent or contrary you feel you have that authority and control? I do, sir, if necessary, derive from the Secretary of the Army's ultimate authority with regard to such matters. Terrific. Uh, certainly a lot of discussion has been going on that just didn't start this year. Uh, so this is for General Murray and uh, you, Mr. Bush. Subcommittees, Paid particular attention and generally supported the Army's uh, ambitious modernization strategy. I talked about that just a moment ago. Uh, but the consideration of technical uh, achievability, the risk, the affordability, and the 22 budget requests for research, development, acquisition, there's an 11% decrease as compared to last year's inactive amount. Uh, 
this does not inspire confidence in the stability of your programs given the evidence of a likely procurement foul weight. We talked about that a few minutes ago. Uh, when expensive systems are in development, they rarely get cheaper. And obviously, uh, that upgrade is one of our biggest concerns. Uh, understanding the Army's modernization strategy was perhaps, and some have suggested, never realistically affordable, and that your plans are unachievable without additional funding from your current and likely top lines. Uh, we talked about reallocation of dollars, uh, but there has been a suggestion that you are not going to be able to do that just with the allocation that you're going to need a plus up. Uh, how are you going to deal with the flat lines that uh, this year, perhaps future, in achieving those goals that are your number one priorities? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll start, and uh, I'd like General Murray to also uh, mm -hmm. fill in here, given his many years of experience. Uh, I would uh, first point out that um, the Army's overall budget is $173 billion. The portion we're here to testify about today is uh, $34 billion, or only about 20% of that. So in the future, Army leaders um, do have an ability to, if they chose to, allocate additional resources to this area of the Army's budget. It would affect the affordability calculations you mentioned, sir. Um, the second thing I'd point out there is other things can change, and that's the Army does have dials it can turn regarding the pace of acquiring new systems. Um, the force structure of the Army could change, which would result in changes to what we're required to produce um, and other factors. So this point, sir, FY22, the Army was able to maintain sufficient funding for its highest priorities to keep them on their current paths. Um, that is obviously not a 100% guarantee of success in the future. But the FY22 request, sir, I thought was balanced appropriately. Um, in future years, decisions will be made um, at the appropriate time. And I would just add, Mr. Chairman, that in addition to what Mr. Bush has said already, is, is we go through a process uh, in front of the five-year uh, defense uh, fight up build we call the SPAR, where we sit down and look at exactly what you're talking about, even outside of the fight up, uh, the five-year defense plan, to ensure that we begin look at resources in the out years um, to make sure that we can't afford to do exactly what you're talking about. And I mentioned up front, 22 in the next four years, but some of these won't deliver and really go into full rate production into until late 20s and even early 30s huh. in some of the programs. And so um, I, I, I do think that we take a hard look at that every year. Uh, the affordability piece of it is a discussion Mr. Bush and I have every year uh, with, with everybody that puts this plan together. Um, but I would just remind you that, I mean, this is more than modernization for the Army. Uh, we, we call this a transformational change, which General McConville describes as once every 40 years. Um, and, you know, the, the risk of not following through on the transformation we've started is our, our soldiers are going to have the same equipment they have today 20 years from now. And I do think that would put them at a serious disadvantage on that future battlefield. So from what I hear, the suggestion that was made recently that plans for this production shielding is not achievable without additional funding based on what you told me you both disagree with that is that correct i'll speak first sir i i do disagree with that very good mr bush yes sir i i also disagree it, it there's always choices to be made within an entity as large as the Army with regard to the priority efforts. So um, it's up to the judgment of uh, leaders to make those calls. With, and I would just, I would add, sir, with risk. Informed risk, you do that every, and that is certainly one of the challenges. Uh, thank you. Uh, I now recognize Mrs. Hartzler, a ranking member. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bush, I'd like to start with you. I'm, I'm deeply concerned about the budget request for the procurement of Army ammunition, and specifically the small and medium caliber request uh, account. 
The FY22 president's budget request reflects severe reductions in the budget request for the 556 millimeter, the 762 millimeter, and the 50 caliber ammunition. The reductions from the FY21 enacted levels equate to reductions of 26%, 28%, and 49% respectively for an overall reduction of approximately 30% in the small arms ammunition account. And this is concerning to me because last year's FY22 FIDEP reflected an increase for each of these accounts. And so we're not only not increasing them, but we have severe reductions. I'm concerned that these severe reductions will affect the overall readiness of our ground forces and severely handicap their ability to train and to fight. Additionally, the severity of these reductions will have an impact on the ability to sustain a workforce at the Lake City Ammunition Plant, the location of where the Army plans to build the 6.8 millimeter ammunition for the next generation squad weapon. With these proposed cuts, the Army is risking losing an experienced workforce, which could take nine months to years to restore. And the projection from the current contractor is that 500 to 700 employees would lose their jobs. And many of these employees uh, are not only constituents of mine, but they have worked there for years and have this training and this capability that just can't be easily replaced or the spigot turned back on in nine months. So, Mr. Bush, why is the Army requesting such a large reduction from what was previously planned for small army arms ammunition? Uh, and what solutions are being considered within the Pentagon to mitigate the risk to the health and resilience of America's critical defense industrial uh, support base. Spam, thank you for the question. Um, so I would start with, uh, and I'll let General Murray add on the requirements side here. The Army every year makes adjustments to its ammunition production in order to achieve stocks required for both training and uh, overseas contingencies and war plans. So year to year fluctuations do occur. Um, those reductions do that you noted do reflect a movement of funds away from those things to protect other things in the budget. So they are part of that judgment call that was made. Um, I'm not familiar. I apologize with the specific potential workforce effects you're citing. I'm happy to meet with you and your staff to discuss those to learn more about. Uh, I had not heard any numbers along those lines, ma'am, but I'd be happy to learn more and work with you on what how those are calculated or what the possible options might be to mitigate. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like General Murray to answer the requirements part. That's okay. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Bush. Ma'am, the, uh, it, it's part of the, the, what the chairman mentioned earlier in terms of the decrease in RDA and procurement accounts. So $4.2 billion as we looked at that decrease across the board, where could we accept risk? What we consider to be acceptable risk in order to account for that decrease in the RDA and procurement and the procurement accounts for the RDA accounts. And so when we worked with the operational community uh, here inside the Pentagon and then with Forces Command, who does the training, um, as we looked across the board, we thought that was an acceptable level of risk given the stocks we currently have on hand and what's projected in terms of requirements for those calibers of ammunition. Okay. Uh so let's let's talk about the next squad weapon. So the subcommittee understands that the next generation squad weapon is evaluating three candidate rifles and three candidate 6.8 millimeter bullet technologies to replace the M4 carbide and its 556 millimeter round in close combat. So can you give us a status of the next generation squad weapon program and under what circumstances? And when will the Army consider retirement of all 556 millimeter rifles and carbines and provide soldiers the 6.8 millimeter rifles? Ma'am, I can take the first part of that on the programmatics. I'll let General Murray talk about requirements. Um, so as you know, uh, this is a program that's using new authorities from Congress. Uh, we are in the middle of rapid prototyping right now with, uh, as you mentioned, more than one vendor. Um, we are looking to make a rapid fielding decision early in the first quarter of FY22, um, down to one, at which point we would proceed into rapid fielding and initial production. Um, that includes selecting uh, the ammunition to go along with the weapon. So, ma'am, as you know, right now, that 
requirement is not for the entire Army. So I'll let General Murray talk about the future of 556. Yes, ma'am. And, and it is actually, as you know, two uh, different weapons, so a rifle and an automatic rifle uh, with a common cartridge. And so, and as you mentioned, ma'am, the it's right now we're programming for the, the close combat force plus some additionals in, in terms of special operations command. So the number is somewhere around 120,000 we're talking about right now with a combination of the two. Um, and then we have not uh, considered yet whether we will replace uh, the M4 and the M16, the M4 carbine, and the M16, which fires the 5.56 millimeter ammunition we spoke of. That's, that is a future decision to be made, very much dependent upon what we find with the prototyping effort we have going on right now. Okay, very good. Um, and Mr. Bush, please describe the plan and timeline to establish the 6.8 millimeter ammunition manufacturing at Lake City Army Ammunition Plant to support the feeling of and training with the new rifle as well as necessary to be reserves. Yes, ma'am. So, could you please describe, yeah, the, the plan and the timeline for establishing the 6.8 ammunition plant there at Lake City. Yes, ma'am. So uh, the FY22 request includes the funding for preliminary work necessary to support whatever ammunition type is selected for production at Lake City in the future. So that's my understanding is that all of that preliminary work is properly funded and fully funded in FY22. What would follow is a transition over a number of years from initially contractor produced ammunition to um, capability at Lake City to produce uh, everything the Army needs for that new type of ammunition. It would take place over, uh, I believe it's three to four years before it's completely transitioned because of the requirements for a new facility. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And, and before we change subjects, I do uh, appreciate your offer to meet with me, my staff, about this issue and how to mitigate it um, and to learn more, because obviously this is real concerning uh, to us here in Missouri. So um, thank you. Yes, um, if I could talk a little bit of shift to combat vehicle programs, uh, Lieutenant General Smith, I'm pleased to see that the Marine Corps uh, FY2022 request continues procurement plans for the purchase of 92 amphibious combat vehicles for Marine Corps replacement for the aging amphibious assault vehicle, which I recently had a, a chance to see the, the new one. As the Marine Corps primary armored infantry carrier for ship to shore assault and armored operations inland, Please provide the status of the Marine Corps progress for the development and fielding of the ACV. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that. Ma'am, the amphibious combat vehicle is on track. It's on schedule for performance and for cost. So the folks up at uh, BAE up in uh, York, Pennsylvania, kind of fought their way, way through COVID. They worked with the Italian government. Uh, Ibeco was the original manufacturer to make sure that that, that program stayed viable through COVID. We we're on track for the production numbers that we anticipated seeing. We've produced the first two platoons of those vehicles. One platoon carries an entire company. Uh, it's a little bit of marine math, but a platoon carries a company. And so we have prioritized our marine expeditionary units who were always out there deployed on board our naval amphibious ships. So the first two of those platoons are out. They're out in California in our desert training base at 29 Palms. Their readiness is, is good. Uh, the training ship first to the second platoon, uh, changing from tracked vehicles to wheeled vehicles required a little bit of adjustment for our drivers. They made that change and met their, their objectives for the uh, initial operating testing capability. So we did, did declare initial operating capability. Again, that's a big picture on schedule, on and on budget, and uh, scheduled to meet our needs to the in the most rapid way possible, replace the amphibious assault vehicle, which, as you said, is is aging at some, and uh, that's what we owe the Marines. I don't know if that answers your question, ma'am. If, if I get into yes, it does. no, that sounds like good news to me. It's nice when you hear that's on cost and it's on uh, schedule, production-wise, and certainly it's needed after some of the uh, the accident and what's happened with some of the other vehicles. So. We're glad to see that. Um, General Murray, uh, I'd like to ask you, the next generation combat vehicle is one of the Army's top six modernization priorities. And the Army has used resources freed up by program terminations and reductions to fund efforts to develop a next generation combat vehicle 
Central to this effort has been development of the optionally manned fighting vehicle, a program intended to replace the B-2 Bradley infantry fighting vehicle. Can you provide an update on the Army's modified strategy and current plans for the optionally manned fighting vehicle? And how did these plans and last year's cancellation of the solicitation for the OMFE affect plans for further upgrades and fielding of the Bradley infantry fight fighting vehicle? Yes, ma'am. Um, and so for OMFE optionally manned fighting vehicle, uh, as you probably know, we started off with an entirely different approach uh, when we approached it from a, from a, and I'll say this requirement standpoint and, and an entirely different approach is we didn't start with a requirement. We started with a list of characteristics that we went out to industry and, and it was really intended with, uh, with characteristics and not requirements to allow industry to be innovative and take advantage of the innovative thought and processes that go on inside of industry. So we, uh, we put out an RFP. We had a number of vendors come back and express interest. And we also started not with bending metal. We started with a digital design as our first phase. We are getting where we will down select to up to five uh, vendors uh, based upon those digital designs. And then we'll take it a step further and work with those five vendors. Um, and we are a number of years out before we'll ask any of uh, whoever it is that we end up selecting to actually bend metal and produce a vehicle. So we're trying to take advantage of commercial best practices in terms of uh, digital twinning and digital design to include putting soldiers uh, against these digital designs for a, a virtual soldier touch point to make sure we understand what's most important to our soldiers as we progress forward. Right now, uh, we, we believe we're on track. Uh, my conversations with industry is they're receptive of this, this approach. Um, and then we'll see as this, progr this program progresses. Um, in terms of the N2 Bradley, um, you know, that is our infantry fighting vehicle uh, for today and for the near term future. So we do have plans for the Bradley, A, what we call the A4, the version, the most recent version of the Bradley. Um, we, will, we will most likely not produce A4s across the Army because we won't need to by the time we get to the optional man fighting vehicle. But the, the sustainment of the Bradley fighting vehicle, uh, there are funds against that. The upgrade of the Bradley fighting vehicle for both the A3 version and the A4 version, there are funds against that to make sure that our soldiers have the capability they'll need until we are able to deliver the optionally manned fighting vehicle. Very good. Thank you for the update. Uh, I yield back, Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Carvajal, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Smith and General Murray, the Army and Marine Corps are resourcing initiatives to improve the form, fit, and function of personal protective equipment to better accommodate female soldiers and Marines. Can you update our subcommittee on the status of these efforts to improve PPE for female service members? Does the budget provide you enough funds to properly study and then procure this PPE? And sir, I'll, I'll go first. The, um, the answer to your last question is absolutely. So as you know, uh, the Army has been working on, and, and you know, we call it female body armor, uh, but uh, uh, what I would prefer to say is body armor that's better uh, produced and, and cut uh, for our female soldiers. Uh, so things like uh, to accommodate different sizes, we have vastly expanded the types of sizes we're offering, and I would argue it's not only just for our females, but it's also for our, sol our smaller statured uh, male soldiers as well. Um, we have made some special accommodations for female specific gear in terms of uh, undergarments for the body armor, different cuts of the, what we call the, the, the plate carrier or the IBA the, 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 where the plates go into. Um, we are making modifications to the plates themselves to enable not only our female soldiers, but all soldiers uh, to be, become better marksmen in terms of the, we call it a shooter's cut. Um, we have done in more research on light, lighter weight materials and seeing some significant improvements in, in the ability to lightweight uh, for all our soldiers, not only the, the body armor itself, but the, the helmet as, as well to and, and keep the same levels of protection. 
So the research and development up at Natick uh, is almost continuous. And then as we make those breakthroughs, we roll that out into production to continually improve our protective material, our protection for our soldiers. Great. Uh, well, it's uh, Eric Smith uh, for the Marine Corps. Um, what I would say, sir, is that our first and foremost piece is we, we are interested in Marines comfort, but what I'm committed to is their protection. So what we've done is we've changed the number of sizes that we have. Instead of the old timey, small, medium, and large, we've made extra small, extra small, short, extra small, long, extra small, et cetera. And that includes right now going from the normal fifth percentile to 95th percentile. That's how we fit most things to the second to 98th percentile. I mean, we can cover anybody between the second and 98th percentile. That currently leaves approximately 200 uh, individual Marines, most of whom are female, below in that one to 2% for smallest stature, and actually about 3,000 uh, Marines, mostly male, in the bigger than 98, extremely tall, et cetera. So in the case of females in particular, it's about 200 who do not have body armor that fits them what we determine to be appropriately. So we have to custom work that before they would go into a combat zone. That is not the case we have now. There is no one deployed with ill-fitting body armor. But we do have 200 Marines who we cannot outfit properly without going to a customized version. So we have, like General Murray, we are absolutely in lockstep with the Army uh, in looking for the best, lightest body armor that protects, adjusting the cuts and shoulders, deltoids, et cetera, so it best fits the, the, the individual Marine. Um, we do have the money to do it. We have what we need. There is a the holy grail, if you will, sir, is conformal body armor. When you start bending plates to make it perfectly fit a body, that is not in the scale, in the, in the realm of possible now, sir. Um, when it becomes the, the, the industry standard, that's great. That'll take care of 100%, but that doesn't exist now, sir. So we default to protection. Comfort comes second. And again, we're about 200 uh, Marines fall below what we're able to outfit without going custom. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Uh, General Smith, uh, my colleagues and I would like assurances that the Marine Corps has taken the necessary steps to prevent any future tragic assault amphibious vehicle accidents, like the one that occurred off of the California coast in 2020. What safety upgrades are being applied to the AAVs throughout the fleet, and how will the ACV be safer and more effective? Yes, sir. First, sir, anytime we bring that mishap up, the first thing we owe, I owe, is the uh, personal condolences, which aren't enough and don't do anything to bring back our dead sailor and our eight dead Marines. Nothing I can say today will, will fix that. And um, the, the mishap was 100% preventable and also 100% inexcusable on every level. What we've done, sir, to for the AAV that still does exist until the amphibious combat vehicle can replace it, we've inspected all of our vehicles for their watertight seals and nothing gets in, into the water without that inspection. There's a pretty robust checklist for everything from training to the actual seals on the vehicle. To make sure that those vehicles that do enter the water with safety boats for training are completely viable and safe. The ACV is a completely, the Amphib Combat Vehicle uh, is a different design, sir. It does not hold water like the AAV. The ACV, sir, does not work off of a thing called the plenum where, where water is purposely brought in to cool the engine. There's a very small engine compartment that lets uh, about 20 gallons or so of water in there to cool it. It has a completely different hull form that has fewer penetration points so that water cannot get in and accumulate fewer entry points. It runs off of a completely different design than the you know, 50 year old AAV, the uh, amphibious uh, assault vehicle. So the design is completely different, sir. And we do not and will not see those kind of incidents with the amphib combat vehicle. That's your original, thank, sir. Thank, thank you, General. I'm out of time. I have a couple more questions, but they'll be submitted for uh, the record. Um, thank you very much. Uh, back to you. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. You are recognized for five minutes. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank thank our witnesses today, General Smith. I'd like like to uh, to, to start with you. Um, we know that um, there's been a lot of focus on the changing nature of what the Marine Corps is going to be faced with, and uh, we know that you have to be able to to reach out uh, and place at risk our adversaries at long distances. And one of those uh, elements in the Commandant's planning guidance is about uh, ground-based anti-ship missiles. And I want to refer to uh, the testimony, not just from the Commandant in his planning guidance, but also uh, in March of 21, the former Indo-PACOM commander, uh, Admiral Phil Davidson, emphasized this. And I'm going to use his words. He said this. He said, the expansion of ground-based fires enables the maneuver of our maritime and air forces because what you get is the requirement for much more intense search or offensive capability out of our adversaries. They also have to look for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance in their networks. If we want to make our adversaries work harder to find our stuff and defend against it, that's what deterrence is about. It's about imposing cost. And I, as I look at Admiral Davison's words and I ponder them, as well as the Commandant's planning guidance, I find myself in complete agreement, which is why uh, last year, Congressman Gallagher and myself worked to correct the appropriator's mistake that unfortunately found itself in cutting funding in half for ground-based anti-ship missiles. And unfortunately, the cuts uh, stood in the final appropriations bill. I just don't think the appropriators understood the critical nature of that and why it was needed. In the PB-22 request, uh, the Marine Corps is also seeking funding for $102 million for 10 production representative models and also to make sure those models are operationally tested as part of the ground-based anti-ship missile capability. I want to get you to elaborate on why this anti-ship missile capability is so critically important for the Marine Corps, especially as you're looking to distribute your operations to create lethality in different areas, to raise the level of uncertainty for our, for our adversaries. I want to make sure we understand you know, why this is important in Marine Corps' force design strategy and why it's the foundation of what you are doing going ahead in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. I, I'll be brief. So that ground-based anti-ship missile, which is the Naval Strike Missile, the same one fired out of an LCS out of, out of Navy systems, it fits on the back of a joint light tactical vehicle, which has been robotized. Highly mobile, internally transportable in our C-130s, movable by the future light amphibious warship and all of our current surface connectors. That small Marine unit, we would refer to as an expeditionary advanced base operation, perhaps 75 Marines, that's carrying uh, up to, let's say, 18 of these missiles, highly mobile, can in fact place at risk an adversary naval force, reaching out in, in the unclassified setting, sure, in excess of 100 miles against a ship. We have successfully tested this at Point Magoo uh, at a range of uh, right around 100 miles, again, for the purposes of this open hearing. Um, that missile allows us to hold forces, enemy forces at risk, and to open sea lanes in support of distributed maritime operations for our fleet commanders. When we have this, and when the adversary has to respect a force of only 75 Marines, they have to, to your point and Admiral Davidson's point, and Admiral Ocalino, the current commander's point, it causes the adversary to spread out their in, uh, information or intelligence surveillance reconnaissance network and look at everything. Because when everything is a threat, that is how you enable fleet maneuver. Because now they're worried about everything, things that were too small to worry about now, that small thing has some lethality that can bring down a vessel, by the way, that costs $2 billion at the expense of a $1.7 million missile. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, yes, sir, General Smith. I appreciate that. That's, that's great. And that's uh, incredibly important as we go forward to make sure that's properly resourced. I want to go now to Mr. Bush and Mr. Uh, Stephanie. As you know, the 1st District of Virginia has a tremendous number of active duty military stationed in bases in every branch of the service, including the Coast Guard. And we also have an extraordinary group of civilians that work with companies that support our members of the military. There's a trend, tremendous amount of, of innovation and creation out there. And what I hear constantly is the high level of frustration and that it's too hard to do business with the with the Department of Defense. Uh, they get into uh, 
the SBIR process and the small business technology transfer of the STTR programs. The problem is, is they can do the research and development. So they can do the phase one and phase two, but it's very hard for them to graduate, to actually scale up, to take what they've developed in concept and actually grow their businesses. And one of two things happen. Either they get capped because if they grow larger, they actually get penalized, they can't do business, or they finally give in and one of the big primes purchases them. And then that innovation and technology never makes its way into uh, the hands of our warfighter because the primes buy it up and then shelve it. So they are essentially pushing back against competition. I, I want to know uh, you know, what's DOD doing to actively discourage this in order in order to to help? I hear a lot of words about, oh, yeah, yeah, we're looking at those companies, but I see very little in terms of, of real numbers. Um, I want to know what you're doing internally to fix this systemic acquisitions issue and what you're doing to try to get these businesses that work very hard to grow and that take very innovative and creative ideas and actually get them to the point where we can feel them. That's what I believe the future is going to be. And unfortunately, what happens right now is they either fade away or they get vacuumed up by the primes. Mr. Bush or Mr. Stefani? Okay, yes, sir. I'll, I'll take this one uh, first, Representative uh, Whitman. Uh, so, so, yes, you, you're describing what I guess we would describe uh, often as, as the valley of death in the research and development world, where, yes. where a, a small company or, or even a mid sized company will have a great idea, we get it get it going and then it doesn't get pulled into a, a major acquisition program with the big prime. So very, very aware of, uh, of the problem. Um, and it, as far as what we're doing about it, well, uh, we have a, a number of uh, our, our uh, Office of Naval Research has, uh, we call it Integrated Naval Prototyping Program, that's specifically built to, to cross that, to take promising ideas that actually have matured to uh, what you would say maybe a, a, a server level two and get them across and pull them into an experimentation or a um, or an actual prototyping a rapid prototyping kind of event attached to a major major program and so we could show you that alignment where we were trying to actually take those and, um, and, and map them directly to programs of records so that you can actually see those alignments uh, Very good. and in the past it's been like we just kind of waited for industry to do it now we're trying to actively map them map them across very good. The gentleman's Thank time has expired. Uh, We're going to have another round here. Okay. Thank you. Brown. Uh, Mr. Brown, recognize five minutes. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, my first question is for General Murray, uh, and good afternoon. I had an opportunity recently to meet with uh, your colleague, uh, General uh, Potter, the Army G2. Uh, and it's uh, my understanding that uh, the G2 leads uh, the ISR task force charged with ensuring that uh, ISR concerns uh, and capabilities are integrated into and support the CFTs as required. Can you just describe uh, to the uh, committee the process by which the ISR task force interacts with the CFTs and how uh, any ISR requirements or modernization priorities are being addressed by Army Futures Command. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Congressman Brown. It's good to see you again. So that, you know, much like logistics, ISR is a part of every one of the cross-functional teams. Um, and if, if you looked at uh, the way we look at requirements, uh, things like Titan, which is a Intel system, is very, very high on our list as we look at our future requirements. The uh, ISR task force is a key contributor at things like project convergence uh, back in uh, the one we did last fall, the one we will do again this fall, and the one we will do in 22. Uh, the, the ability to, if you remember, project convergence 20 was all about sensor to shooter uh, look, and, and the ISR task force provides us the sensors through either organic means, national means, other service means, but that all revolves around the ISR task force. Um, the ISR task force is also intimately involved with the artificial intelligence task force at Carnegie Mellon as we begin to look at the algorithms that we're developing to really refine that sensing and do some of the automated, uh, the PED work, the, the processing of the information that comes off the sensors. Um, 
General Potter and I have conversations probably at least weekly, if not more, in terms of the integration of the sensing part of it that ISR provides. Uh, so short of being another cross-functional team, uh, ISR task force and the, the superstars they've got on that task force are in daily conversations, not only at AS, AFC headquarters, but really across all the cross-functional teams and are, are highlighted and key parts of all the experimentation we do, most recently Edge 21 at Dugway Proving Ground. Thank you. Uh, for uh, General Smith and also for you, General Murray, picking up where I think uh, Representative Whitman was uh, in terms of presenting, you know, multiple lethalities uh, and uh, challenges uh, to our adversaries. Um, I always get a little concerned when I hear, you know, one service suggesting that another service's modernization priorities uh, are uh, not uh, necessarily well conceived or that they're duplicative. You know, the Army has, you know, as a t the top uh, modernization priority, uh, long range precision fires and general Smith, you just talked about with, uh, with uh, Representative Whitman, uh, the value, the importance of the ground-based anti-ship missile. Um, Air Force certainly has a role to play as well. I mean, they, they provide a long range uh, um, air to ground, air to air fire. Can you just talk a little bit about how the, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council um, is involved in ensuring that uh, these bio modernization priorities with the different services are kind of aligned with one another or in sync with one another, not at odds with one another, but in fact complement uh, each other when we think about the joint warfighter operating concept. And we'll start with Major uh, with, with General Stevens, and then we'll go over to uh, General Murray, please. Uh, Congressman Brown, good to see you, sir. Uh, the the JROC, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council does in fact serve confirm programs or records. So underneath the leadership of uh, General Hyten, our vice chairman, you must pass requirements through the JROC. So all of the things that we seek in terms of long range precision fires, and I'm in literally sort of in weekly contact with Lieutenant General Richardson, who is uh, the deputy down for, for General Murray, literally weekly, sir, on our long range precision fires efforts together. We are appropriately overlapped, but not duplicative. We, we each have a role to play. We are certainly very light and mobile and have X range. The Army is much uh, more uh, long range. They bring more heft to the fight. Both of those are characteristics that the Joint Force Commander has asked for. So again, sir, we both seek long range precision fires that we can employ within our, our maneuver space and within our units. But they are certainly not duplicative, sir. They are complementary. And the JROC does oversee that. And I'll, I'll uh, stop there, sir, and pass to uh, General Murray. And, and Chairman, I think we're out of time. You want me to answer that? You can finish the answer. All right. Uh, and, and I would just echo General Smith's comments. And, and we do do, between the Army and the Marine Corps, and, and really, if you look at project convergence across all five of the services to now include the Space Force. It is it is weekly synchronization meetings. I echo his comments on the JROC's role. And then the other thing I'd say, Congressman, is it, it's all in support of the joint warfighting concept. And as that emerges, um, I, I think you'll see the complementary nature of that. And I appreciate you using that word. And our ability to prevent pro provide multiple dilemmas uh, from the land, from the sea, uh, from the air, is, is critical to present those multiple dilemmas to any potential adversary and not allow them to focus on one particular thing. And I would just say in closing is, you know, we always have and always will fight as a joint force and we'll all make contributions to that fight. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You got it. Mr. Bacon, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate the uh, panel today. Thanks for your leadership and our Army Marines. Uh, we're grateful to you. Uh, Mr. Bush, you've touched on this, but I'm getting some mixed signals, or maybe I'm just not understanding. So let me just uh, clarify. We know we have a need to modernize our tactical wheeled vehicles and to maintain a rate of production that sustains the industry's future capacity. It appears to me from the research I was doing uh, that the Army cut this budget area and shifted funds to other areas. So we're concerned about how this will weaken a fragile domestic industrial base. Can you? Sure. Uh, do you see this as a risk? Are we covering uh, the need? Uh, so I'd li like to get your uh, perspective. Thank you. 
Sir, you are correct in identifying that uh, funds were shifted from some elements of that portfolio to protect other things. Yes, sir. So the Army's judgment is that at this time it is an acceptable risk, but there is there are no such thing as no risk, especially when you make changes year on year. So, sir, at this time, we don't see an existential risk to that industrial base across the United States, but that doesn't mean there's going, going to be any effect at all from the shift of resources. Is it true that we, we have shifted resources in many of the recent budgets? Is that, is that correct? So I can't speak in detail about previous budgets, but uh, if you look at the across the tactical wheel, wheel vehicle fleet, um, year to year there are changes there. And sometimes things are moved from there to other higher priorities. But is a concern to us uh, on the committee that we'd be able to preserve this industrial capacity uh, if, if we get it too weak and fragile, we won't be able to recover and we don't want to rely on overseas uh, sources. So uh, we may come back to that. We may have to look at that in the NDAA uh, as, as for the one we're working on. Uh, General Smith, I'd like to ask you about the ground air task oriented radar or the Gator and how it's uh, being developed and, and its, its current status. Uh, the U.S. Marine Corps is seeking a, a plus up of about $311 million for eight more Gators. Uh, General, how will the uh, Marines integrate this system into the Marine Littoral Regiment? And are the current fee or the uh, tactical wheeled vehicles, are they uh, built to accommodate uh, the Gator or is it easy to integrate? Thank you. Sure, thanks for the question. The, the Gator radar is our radar of the future. It's called the TPS-80. And we're seeking to accelerate a success story. Like the ACV, it's on schedule on cost and it's actually exceeding performance uh, parameters. We fully populated uh, one of the radars at a test facility in Baltimore and um, what it achieved would exceed the classification level of this committee and most of the spaces within the, the house. We would have to go to a, a different compartment to talk about it. So it is a real success story. It is internally transportable by our KC-130Js, which is the key for us, sir. And what it does is it, it gathers and passes data to the joint force. Uh, under General Murray's leadership and that of uh, Lieutenant General Jim Richardson for Project Convergence 21, we'll take one of our Gator radars out to Project Convergence at the Yuma Proving Ground uh, this fall, and it will gather and pass data to the joint force, um, to the Navy, to the Army. It is, a, it is a phenomenal collector, even in a passive mode. So we're trying to accelerate the success and finish the buy early to save dollars and get that uh, proven asset into the hands of the warfighters. We took it to Australia last year at an exercise called Talisman Saver, performed extremely well. And it, it is on performance schedule and cost. And uh, it is, again, highly mobile, sir, and highly useful in the Indo-Pacific or other theaters because of its lightness and mobility. And the wheeled vehicles that move it are part of our our inventory, sir, and, and it is it is mobile on the ground due with our current ground vehicle modernization or ground vehicle strategy enables that mobility, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, shifting gears to both John Murray and General Smith, if, and I know my time's running short. I see a need for long range surface to surface precision fires, especially when your opponents or potential adversaries have them. I also see a problem in the Pacific where there's lack of operating areas. Does this not concern you when we have very limited operating areas, whereas China can hide them anywhere in its country? Are, are, won't this be a challenge for us for putting a lot of resources in this weapon system? And I know I don't have much time left, so I got 10 seconds. Thank you. you know, Eric, you want to? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Very quickly. So, obviously, sir, there's, there's two pieces of that. For us, you know, the best place that that you can operate from as a naval vessel. But I would offer sure that these long range precision fires assets, we do have a lot of friends in the region. Uh, in all candor, China does not. We have a lot of friends there. Um, and we, we do always seek through diplomatic efforts to gain uh, to gain access. If a, and I won't speak for the combatant commander, sure, but these long range fires capabilities that, that the army uh, seeks in, in very long range, and we speak in a, in a shorter or medium range uh, to complement each other, if an existential threat to the <coughs> Or we each carry the capability. I will not speak for the Army, but, but I've seen him in action. I work for him in Iraq. Um, we, we have the ability 
to seize for a short period of time and hold pieces of ground in order to conduct operations, even, even when not, uh, quote, approved. That is why we do raids, airfield seizures, et cetera. So while not the first option, sir, it's a capability that, that the Marine Corps uh, retains, and I would pass to General Murray. Well, I have to yield my time back. I really appreciate uh, your all's insights. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for indulging me an extra minute. Absolutely. Ms. Sherrill, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bush and General Murray, as we switch to the 6.8 millimeter round and leave behind the NATO standard 5.56 millimeter ammunition, uh, I, I just have a couple of questions about interoperability. So what can you tell us about whether our NATO allies would support a planned NATO-wide adoption of the 6.8-millimeter uh, round? Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, right now, we are not having those conversations, with, to my knowledge, with NATO because we have not yet made the decision to go away from 5.56-millimeter. And so the, the 6.8 would initially go to the close combat forces, which is around 120,000, leaving yet the rest of the 1.1 million uh, people that are in the United States Army across all three compos uh, with 5.56 and, and the M4 carbine slash M16. Uh, that, that's a future decision based upon what we see out of the 6.8 uh, developmental work that we're doing right now. Great, thank you. Um, and then I wanted to move into some of the, uh, the discussion about landmines. So as, as you know, the use of landmines in warfare is quite controversial. There's an international mine ban treaty against anti-personnel mines of which the US is not a member. But historically, many US commanders are against the use of landmines due to the risks they present to mobility and the fear of killing um, their own forces according to a GAO study. So I have some questions about the inclusion of landmine procurement in the FY22 budget. Uh, Mr. Bush or General Murray, how much of the procurement is focused on anti-personnel landmines? Ma'am, I believe very little. The uh, pro programs we have, to my knowledge, are focused more on anti-vehicles. So did the U.S. use any anti-personnel landmines in recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan? Uh, Ma'am, again, I'm, I'm not aware. I'd have to get that one for you for the record if we actually use those systems in conflict. Do you know when the last time the U.S. used mines in conflict? And I'm happy to submit that for the record. Yeah, that, that, you know, we're probably going to take that one for the record. I don't want to give you a, a wrong answer. Um, my experience, which is almost five years between Iraq and Afghanistan, we were we were not using anti-personnel mines. But that that's five years out of the last 20. So we probably better take that for the record. Uh, I'll submit it for the record. Thanks. Um, so I know you mentioned that you had the money that you needed for female body armor, small stature body armor, but it is on the list of unfunded priorities provided by the committee staff. I, it lists uh, female or small stature body armor as unfunded. Um, and so when was the last time women or small stature soldiers used this body armor in conflict? I assume they've been using this re in recent conflict. We've had the female body armor and the small stature body armor from your testimony. Yes, ma'am. It's been a transition. The, the latest efforts is what General Murray was describing um, very well regarding the multiple sizes and that's um, with regard to the unfunded uh, item that is over and above what's in the budget. And I believe the unfunded list refers to that as an opportunity to accelerate fielding. So uh, there is funding for some. Um, it's not zero in the base budget. That money in the UFER list, my reading of it was it would accelerate the pace of fielding. And then, so it just seems like this female body armor, small stature body armor is a critical funding piece. Having been in the military myself with gear that didn't fit, not being able to fly over water during specifically cold months because my dry suit didn't fit, um, you know, this seems like a pretty critical piece of gear. And I guess as, as I'm looking at the transition to great power competition against near peers, why are we looking at landmines as, as, so, as an imperative? Well, ma'am, I would, so landmines are used primarily to shape terrain. 
Um, and so both from an anti-vehicle, anti-personnel standpoint, and I'm going back in history uh, to where I, how I grew up in the Army, it, it's really a terrain shaping munition. Uh, the, the investment we're doing right now in terms of landmines uh, are policy compliant, although we are not a signatory, policy compliant uh, munitions, so we have that ability to shape terrain in the future. And, and why do you want to shape terrain is to narrow options for your opponent. And I can submit my final question for the record because I'm running out of time, but I am curious about if you foresee use of landmines in any sort of conflict with China um, in the future, and I can take that for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jackson, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Norcross, uh, Ranking Member Hartzler, and uh, thanks to the thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Uh, the first thing I want to say is uh, something that many of my colleagues, including ranking member, have already said. Uh, the budget cut to the Department of Defense being proposed by this administration, in my mind, is somewhat unacceptable in the situation they're in right now. Uh, I support cutting waste and finding ways to save money. However, decreasing the top line for the Department of Defense is, in my mind, a short-sighted and political move at best. Uh, the Army was one of the hardest hit by uh, this year's budget request with a 2% decrease in proposed funding from last year's enacted level. However, cuts for the Army won't be just starting in FY22. We know this. Over the last three years, the Army has terminated 310 existing programs, and the FY22 request, the Army proposed to cut or delay an additional 37. Uh, these cuts include armored vehicles, intelligence workstations, and individual weapon sites. Uh, I maintain a belief that if a program is not working as we would like it to, we should stop funding it. However, I'm not in favor of cutting programs that are beneficial or potentially beneficial to the warfighter. The Army claims that the FY22 request maintains the modernization focus and the momentum that was begun in 2018 with the establishment of the Army Futures Command. The Army also has said that this year's request will not slow our efforts of building a force by 2028 that is more modern and relevant to peer competition and conflict. I strongly support the mission of the Army Futures Command and cross-functional teams. However, I'm confused how we have nearly 350 different programs that can be cut Yet the Army is telling us that there will be minimal impact. General Murray, I, I, I would direct my question to you. I would like you to provide some clarity on, on this if you can. How do we have nearly 350 programs that could be cut, uh, yet removing these programs have no impact on ongoing modernization and lethality efforts? And uh, why would we even have had those programs in place to start with if they weren't worth the in investment that we've put in this so far? Thank you, sir, for that question. And and I, I actually think it's probably a mischaracterization to say they weren't important to begin with. So you you mentioned some of armored vehicles that, that some would call legacy, but are really going to be enduring systems. And so as we looked at how we could protect uh, the Army's highest priorities, uh, the 31 plus four signature systems, and to make sure that we are ready for that, that multi-domain ready force in 28, and then even beyond that into 35 as we look at, at production, is where can we where can we take some what we consider to be and our army senior leaders consider to be acceptable risk to make sure that we can maintain the transformation that we began in 2018 and, and I said this earlier it's much more than just modernization it's how do you go through this transformational change and really begin to take advantage of the technologies that in some cases are already here uh, to make sure that we are ready for that future war fight and so. It's not that any of those programs weren't valuable to us. It's not that any of those programs were, were misconceived when we started them. It's just areas that we could go to to take some level of acceptable risk to make sure that our highest priorities get funded first. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to ask one more question too, and you may or may not be able to answer this, but you know, I understand the future, you know, future cost saving savings may exist, but uh, I just want to be clear. Do you know how much money, how much money has been invested? Uh, already in the 37 programs that are proposed to be delayed or cut in FY22. How much money have we already put into that program, those programs? Any idea? Sir, uh, I can work on getting you that number. Um, especially, it's uh, a little easier to understand the small number of terminations. It's some programs that were slightly reduced, for example, the Abrams tank. I mean, the lifetime government investment of that is going to be in the many, many, many billions. Um, but, sir, I can uh, work with you and your staff to narrow down exactly the numbers you're looking for and get those for you. And, and so I'd also, I'd also add, sir, if I could. So some of the, the terminations were 
um, terminations inside of our equipping bank. Some of these were transitions to sustainment. So the program is just there. Hmm. It's just transitioning into the sustainment phase in its life cycle. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I'd like to get more information on that. I think you guys are doing a wonderful job. I just want to be able to make sure that I can explain to my constituents what we're doing with the money, especially when it comes to the defense budget. I'm really uh, you know, a strong defender of, of our DOD budget, and I want to make sure that I can explain to people when we're getting rid of programs, why we're doing it, and you know that the money wasn't wasted, and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I appreciate your, your time and those answers, and with that, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Is Mr. Horsford on? I didn't see him. If not, Mr. Green, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, today we face, and I want to thank our witnesses for being here. Uh, I too want to echo what my colleague, uh, Congressman Jackson, said. You know, today we face unique threats. We're all talking about the great power competition, large scale ground operations, the switch from fighting a war of, on terror to um, you know, great power competition. Um, the Chinese military has increased its defense spending six fold since 2000. Um, President Biden saw fit this time to slash our defense budget by over 4 billion in real dollars. And as uh, you know, Congressman Jackson said, the army seems to be bearing the brunt of that. They've got the largest army and Navy in the world. This is China, of course, and they work to significantly modernize their weapon systems to gain a superiority. Russia is more than just posturing toward Eastern Europe. And of course, China is repeatedly, repeatedly violating Taiwanese airspe airspace. There are new affiliates from Al Qaeda and ISIS, and the Biden administration is seeking to uproot the progress of the previous administration, despite the bipartisan National Defense Strategy Commission recommending a three to 5% increase in defense spending above the rate of inflation. President Biden is proposing to add trillions of dollars to deficit spending, raising non-defense 16% um, in the face of cutting 4 billion from DOD in real dollars. The moment we fail to maintain vigilance is the moment when a belligerent power will seize the opportunity to tip the balance of power. Um, and I just needed to say that and express my frustration with those uh, real dollar cuts. In terms of my questions, I, I was curious as I listened to you, uh, both the Marine Corps and the Army describe uh, research into body armor. Are you guys both uh, separately doing research projects on body armor and fit to Marines and uh, U.S. Uh, Army personnel? It's, I would describe it as collaborative research, Congressman. And so we do our research at, uh, up at Natick um, in Massachusetts. Um, and then it, across all of our research and development portfolios, it is actually very collaborative. So the, the researchers, the senior researchers from all uh, three of the services in this case, represented Marine Corps represented by the Navy, actually sit down on a quarterly basis and we share our research results. Uh, so that each uh, each one of us understand what everybody else is working on, where we can take advantage of each other's research. So, so y'all are actively you have two programs going, and then you just share information. Is that how it works? Uh, I, I can talk to the Army program. I really can't speak to the to the Marine Corps program, sir. What? Follow for the Marine Corps. We we are in follow of the Army, so our our folks are are absolutely at the table with the Army. So we use that same research, sir, and then we then take the plate, for example, and we put it into a plate carrier that best fits, you know, a Marine who's doing amphibious ops. But the the bulk of it, or the plate, the thing that protects you, uh, we are absolutely together. So that is a the, the sappy plate, sir. That's sure. the plate for all of us. Okay, so the plate. The technology on the materials for stopping the the, the enemy round or, or shrapnel or whatever is a joint thing, and then you and the Marine Corps take that plate and fit it into a piece of equipment that works for a soldier or an, a Marine when he goes over the into the water, right on a, on a ship. One hundred percent correct. Yes, as he's coming ashore. Okay, uh, I just wanted to make sure it sounded as if we had two unique programs going, and in, in your testimony, and that really concerned me. Just just like I think it was someone else. Actually, someone across the aisle was talking about duplicity. 
that's a, that's a big concern for us, how those taxpayer dollars are used to make sure that we're not being duplicitous there. Um, on, uh, I too am very interested, and this is probably a question best for Army Futures, uh, General Murray, uh, the, in, the industrial base, can you kind of let us know how, how they're involved in Army Futures Command? And I, when I got out of the Army and started my healthcare company, I realized probably the biggest challenge was scale uh, in growing my company. And so it seems to me that if those, if the industrial base guys are at the tip of the innovation spear, it might speed the process. And if you could explain kind of how y'all are doing that, if you're doing that and, and what uh, advantage you're getting from it, if you do. And, and sir, I'll, I'll start that and then I'll, I'll let Mr. Bush comment as well. So, and just a small example, and it, it is not only the, the large primes, but it's also the smaller businesses, as you mentioned, as you start up your business. So uh, for instance, uh, we're here later this month, we will have a, what we call a CEO roundtable. And it, it really, what I've kind of stumbled on is describing what problems we're trying to solve to our industry partners is a key thing to do up front. And so they understand what's important to us, they understand the problems we're trying to solve, which allows them to invest their dollars to do the research they need to do to address those future problems. So we'll do that again this, this fall, last, or in, later this month. Last fall, we had well over 400 industry partners uh, on the net as we described the problems we were trying to solve through project convergence. So I, I do think it's that, that continuous constant dialogue, whether it's a large prime or a small business, to understand the problems that we're dealing with is the most important conversation up front. Well, to give you, you know, to put that into perspective, I took my company from 180K in revenue to 600 million in revenue. So I understand the challenge. It's, it's not, you know, on the scale of the United States military, but, but that's, it, it, you got to put the, the innovator at the tip of the spear as well as the guy who's going to manufacture that thing. I think your idea here with the CEOs is amazing. It'd be great if, if I could, I don't know if y'all would allow us to come in and be a fly on the wall, but that would, uh, that would, I would learn a lot from that if you'd allow it. Yes, sir. Happy to do that, sir. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. We're going to do a uh, lightning round here and <laughs> respect everybody to get through it. Uh, General, sir were several questions about the long-range precision fire and the fact that um, several services are doing that and we heard the the commentary by some folks in the air force about being expensive had you or the department of defense or other services done a comparative analysis the cost per engagement between the different services and their long-range fire to give us a sense of cost efficiency. Uh, obviously, they're not all doing exactly the same thing. You know any studies that have been involved on these systems? Uh, Chairman, I, I can't speak for DOD and I obviously can't speak for the other services. I, I will tell you that within the Army, uh, about a year ago, we, I have an organization within Army Futures Command that does analysis for me, is we began to look at uh, the, the cost, if you will, and really the right mix of long range fires capabilities, uh, we called them at that point strategic fires, but the longer range fires within the Army portfolio and what we were looking at. And that, that did consider from a operational effectiveness primarily what the right mix would be. And there are costs associated with that within the Army's long range fires portfolio. Mr. Chairman, on the Marine Corps side, we have the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, we've also, Marine Corps Warfighting Laboratory. We've also done our own and operations analysis division to look at a cost imposition strategy. And it, it, what we seek is the reverse of, with no offense, for those of us that fought in Iraq and Afghanistan, where we would fire a multi hundred thousand dollar Hellfire missile at a four thousand dollar pickup truck, which happened to have a machine gun in the back of it, that's a cost imposition problem. We're now talking about low low million dollar missile against a almost two billion dollar ship. And so we did do cost analysis on what it takes to to incapacitate or to sink a vessel, and the the cost differential is significant. Uh, 
uh, between what we were investing and what the enemy would have to do to both protect the ship in terms of active and passive measures and the actual cost of when we succeed versus when they succeed. So your analysis was within the core itself and not in comparison to the other services. Is that correct? So, so that, that is correct, although the joint warfighting concept, concept, and then obviously I wouldn't speak for OSD uh, cost assessment program evaluation or the joint staff, but they certainly oversee how much each of the services is investing in and, and looking at in terms of a, a, a portfolio of long range systems, all driven by the joint force commander's need for much like a golf bag, uh, seven irons and drivers both look like clubs, but they are certainly not the same. Uh, and but you, you will require them all in a uh, in a relatively uh, difficult maritime environment such as the Indo Pacific. Sure. And the the fact that there's differences in how you apply them and certainly the cost, uh, it is a factor because that goes hand in glove with risk. And yes, sir. as we heard earlier, some programs are not making it. Uh, Mrs. Hartz, are you still on? Yes, sir. Um, yeah. like so I have a, you bet. The administration presented a very dramatic shift in funding in the president budget's submission without any details on the future year's defense plans, the FIDEP. Additionally, the Army identified $4.4 billion worth of unfunded requirements to go along with this dramatic shift in spending priorities. This places Congress in a disadvantage because we can't see the impacts of supporting or disagreeing with these dramatic shifts or these unfunded requirements across the FIDEP. The insight that comes from the FIDEP are essential to ensuring that Congress and this committee can execute our constitutional oversight requirement. So when will the Army deliver a FIDEP? And what should our expe expectations be of FY23 and beyond? And thirdly, will there be further program restructures or has the Army completed most of its adjustments with the President's budget of 22? Ma'am, the uh, current plan, as I understand it, is for the budget, FY23 budget that is delivered uh, early next year would have the full fight of picture for Congress to consider. Um, there are, I think, year to year, always going to be program adjustments, ma'am. So I would say that is undecided at this point, but um, every year we have to look, General Murray and I co-chair co one element of the Army's internal budget reviews, and there are always move arounds to try to make sure that high priority things are funded um, as best possible. So a work in so, progress. All right, so, and so you're saying we won't see a, a FIDEP for this year? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. You're back. All righty, we now, it was a, Ms. Cheryl, you're recognized. Mm -hmm. Nope, I, I skipped Mr. Whitman, forgive me. Okay. No, I, all right, thank you. go for it. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna go uh, back to Mr. Bush and follow up on a question I asked that uh, Mr. Stefani uh, answered about what are you all doing to address our small and medium-sized companies that are falling into this valley of death when it comes to their efforts to, uh, to seek and maintain uh, the innovative and creative uh, business they want to do with the Department of Defense. Thank you, sir. So I think I'll answer two ways, and I'd like General Murray actually to add on something that's a uh, good innovation that's happening at Futures Command with regard to uh, SBIR. Uh, the first thing, sir, it's incumbent upon the government and the Army needs to do a better job when communicating with companies about what, if there is a another side of the valley, so to speak, when they bring them in to do work. So that's an expectation job on our part that we need to do better so the companies aren't investing their own dollars in something that may not have a path to actually being fielded. So within the Army, that requires connecting experimentation or smaller efforts in SBIR to actual programs of record, and there are some good things going on in that area. Uh, one thing I would offer, sir, a counter, two countervailing pressures we have that we are trying to mitigate balance in this area. One is ensuring that defense companies we're working with have cybersecurity that's adequate to protect uh, government secrets. Um, that is a challenge for all companies. It's also a challenge for small businesses who don't have the resources that some of the big companies do. Um, another thing I'd mention is that uh, supply chain risk. So 
again, this is government work to make sure that the companies we're doing business with, if we are actually going to enter into some kind of production arrangement, um, source materials and supplies from companies and places we trust. So, so as a balancing act, I can't say we're doing it perfectly right now, but we are working to balance those risks. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd let General Murray talk about sure. something in futures. Sure. Yes, sir. The uh, Army Applications Lab in, in Austin, Texas with us is, is, and to be honest with you, we struggled for a long time, but we, we may have stumbled on to a, a way of using SBIR dollars. And so we, we've gotten the process down to less than 30 days to award a contract under SBIR. In, in the past, it was upwards of 200 days. Um, and we have done that primarily by simplifying the process for them. And, and it's not sim actually simplifying the process. It's almost like providing a Sherpa service to help small companies that are not familiar with the way the U.S. government does business to help them through the, the process. I think that the most important thing we found is, and Mr. Bush mentioned this, is starting with a problem up front with somebody on the other side that wants to pull them across that valley of death is a key to getting these programs across that valley of death. So working with our program managers, our program executive officers, finding something that will actually solve a problem that they're interested in solving, the problem that they have, and then getting them involved from the very, very beginning to help us with this program has been key and instrumental. Thanks, General. I want to jump into something else real quick with you and General Smith. As we know, uh, the whole issue of optionally manned systems unmanned systems, uh, rogue fires, or as my grandson would call it, rogue fires. Uh, the whole effort is how do we take base technology, the technology that control things like um, uh, uh, the, the operations of the systems, the controls of the part of the systems, all those things are common across those different platforms. What are, what are each of your service branches doing to look at where we can learn from common technologies that are either developed on the private side or that have been developed by another service branch to use those as we spin up these unmanned or optionally manned systems quickly? And, and quickly, so my, my counterpart in the Marine Corps has time, sir. So the, there is a there is a, an autonomy kernel uh, that we developed at the Ground Vehicles uh, System Support Center in, in Warren, Michigan. That is the same technology, the same algorithms that we're using in our leader follower technology. So one, seven or eight trucks followed by, and it's, it's government IP, government developed, and I'll let General Smith take over because it's also the same technology they're using in one of their programs. There you go. Thank you, General Murray. Uh, Congresswoman, that's exactly correct. With the same leader follower technology that's in use by the rogue fires vehicle, it is the industry standard, if you will. Uh, we have an enable unmanned campaign framework uh, signed by the SECNAV, uh, led by Mr. Stephanie, uh, General Kilby, and myself, to, to move forward collectively, jointly, on making sure that the technologies that do exist are used by all. I would note, sir, that, for example, Google cars have hundreds of thousands of miles on them. We are a long way from that. And, and with that steady R&D funding, we will gain the miles and the hours on both surface-borne vessels and on, on ground vehicles, but uh, the challenges we face in that austere environment where it's not a puddle, it's a 15-foot deep hole that's built by a bomb crater, that technology is not yet there, sir, and only a kind of a steady R&D funding will allow us to get Google Car, if you will, to a tactical level for that young soldier, young Marine, uh, to be able to operate a vehicle in, in really horrible austere conditions that, that as you know, sir, will, will come to us when uh, war is visited upon us. Very good. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. You got it. Ms. Sher, are you still on? And I think we are up to Mr. Jackson. You can wrap it up. I think I've, uh, I've got all my questions answered. I appreciate it, though. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, I want to take an opportunity to thank the witnesses for their service and certainly their testimony today. But I'd like to offer up or any closing remarks you might have. Uh, Mr. Bush, let's start with you. Uh, no closing remarks, sir. Just thank you to the members for the time and for uh, considering the Army's request. And I stand ready to meet with members at any time if they have questions and to uh, work through anything they need. So they have all the information we had when making our uh, judgments. Thank you. Uh, Daryl Murray. Nothing more to add, sir, other than thank you for your time today. And so, Mr. Stefano. Uh, yeah. uh, of 
besides thanking you for, for your time, I did want to follow up a little bit on the industrial base part and, and, and uh, the mention of, of uh, how they performed in COVID and how authorities that, that you have given us to uh, improve cash flow and, and make, uh, make our, our crew here and for our sailors and marines uh, during the last year just uh, on, the, on the production water, on the production front. Thank you, uh, General Smith. Mr. Chairman, not that you need it, but uh, but I, I honestly and personally do appreciate the, the courtesy that always comes with this particular subcommittee. It is always a privilege to, to speak to you, and I, I really do appreciate uh, the, the courtesy that, that comes from, from you, sir, uh, from uh, ranking member Hartzler and your members. It's, uh, it's kind of nice to have. Thank you, sir. You got it. Vicki, do you have anything? No, just appreciate everybody's service and uh, the information we received. Look forward to keep working with everybody, buddy. Then we are adjourned. Thank you.